So in case you haven't heard, uh, the theme of TEDx Tampa Bay is the future of stories. So I want to begin by telling you a story this morning set in Colorado Springs. In 2009, the city of Colorado Springs was facing a budget crisis worse than it had ever faced before. It was so bad that the conservative local government was forced to propose a tax increase to citizens, promising that if they voted down the tax increase, uh, that the city would have to begin cutting significant um, city services. Now, the tax increase would have cost the average Colorado Springs homeowner $200 per year. But when they posed the tax increase, the citizens on the ballot, the notoriously conservative constituency of Colorado Springs overwhelmingly voted it down by a two-thirds majority. So the city made good on their promise, and they began to significantly slash city services, including turning off a third of the city's streetlights. Now, when you think of a critical government service, you think of sewage, you think of water, you think of public safety, you probably don't think of your streetlights going out. So when this happened and when the streets started to go dark in Colorado Springs, citizens became concerned. So they went to City Hall and they asked City Hall if they could pay a la carte for the government service that they wanted most, turning on their streetlights. So the city agreed. They created an adopt a streetlight program where citizens could pay to turn on individual streetlights in their neighborhoods. And it may surprise you to hear that droves of citizens took the city up on this offer paying to turn on individual streetlights on their block. It cost the average Colorado Springs citizen in this program $300 (laughs) to turn on a few streetlights in their neighborhood. The citizens, if you remember, would have paid $200 (laughs) to turn on every street light in the city of Colorado Springs, and the tax increase would have funded parks, and firemen, and swimming pools, and community centers. But the citizens of Colorado Springs were more than happy to pay 50% more for far less government services because it wasn't about how much they paid for government services. It was about a desire to control where their money was spent. Today, I want to share with you why I believe this sentiment is shared by citizens across the United States in cities where budgets are just as bleak. From 2008 to 2011, municipalities in the United States have laid off 535,000 government employees. Here in Tampa, in Hillsborough County, the cost per capita of county government services has been reduced 26% from 2007 to 2012. And from the citizens' perspective, all they see is money going to government pensions instead of parks and pools. They see government spending money on services that citizens don't derive direct value from, while the services, while the projects they really want sit on a long waiting list of budget priorities. But what can we do about it? How can citizens get the projects, get the government services they want at a time when government has no way to pay for them? Well, I would argue that historically, this has been the work of what I call traditional philanthropists. Great men like Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller who, through their generosity, helped build today's great American cities. Now, I would argue that philanthropic giving differentiates itself from other forms of giving and that it is big, it is public, and it is tangible. Now, up until recently, you had to be a Carnegie or a Rockefeller with millions or billions of dollars in personal wealth in order to make these types of gifts. But today, we are seeing the rise of the micro-philanthropist. Digital tools are empowering hundreds and thousands of people like you and me to crowdsource and crowdfund gifts that are big, that are public, and that are tangible. Now, microphilanthropists are not just giving up their money, right? They're also giving up their time to do things that are big. In his fantastic book, which I would recommend to all of you, uh, Here Comes Everybody by Clay Shirky. Shirky writes, quote, 
We have lived in a world where little things are done for love and big things are done for money. Now, we have Wikipedia. Suddenly, big things can be done for love. Microphilanthropists are doing things that are big, they're also doing things that are public. Currently, right now in the Netherlands, citizens are crowdfunding the building of a bridge that will give pedestrians safe passage over a busy highway. They are literally purchasing planks, individual planks of the bridge to bring this bridge to life decades before it was planned. Earlier this morning, Nathan mentioned the Nikola Tesla Museum, which raised $1.3 million from microphilanthropists to build a museum in Tesla's honor. Microphilanthropists are doing things that are very public. They're also doing things that are highly tangible. Charity Water is a nonprofit who, through the generosity of microphilanthropists, brings clean and safe drinking water to people in developing nations. Now, 10 years ago, I would imagine that none of us in this room could have built a well of clean water in Africa on our own. But today, we all can. The microphilanthropists are doing things that for centuries could have only been done by traditional philanthropists. Today, the 99% is doing what 10 years ago only the 1% could accomplish philanthropically. We are witnessing the democratization of philanthropy. So you have government that has no money, right? You have citizens who are willing to pay out of their own pocket above and beyond what they give in taxes to the government projects and services that they care about most. And simultaneously, you have this trend of, of micro-philanthropy where digital tools are empowering us all to crowdfund and crowdsource gifts that are big, that are public, that are tangible. So earlier this year, myself and a few others began to notice these trends and started to ask, what would it look like if we applied these principles, the principles of crowdsourcing and more specifically crowdfunding to government, what would it look like if we had Kickstarter for government? No, we are not gonna crowdsource, crowdfund the national debt. Okay, let's just get that out of the way now. But our solution is a product called Citizen Investor, a crowdfunding platform for local government projects that launched last week in the city of Philadelphia. Thank you. I believe that by applying the principles of crowdfunding to government at the local level, we can help greenlight government projects faster, we can hold government more accountable, and lastly, and maybe most importantly, we can make the government budgeting process more participatory than ever before. Today, in municipalities across the country, there are literally thousands of projects that are sitting on a shelf, ready to go, collecting dust, because the municipality simply doesn't have the money to kick them off. By allowing citizens to vote with their dollars on which of those projects get started today, citizens, micro-philanthropists, can get the projects they want at a time when government has no other way to pay for them. By applying the principles of crowdfunding to local government, I really believe that we can help hold government more accountable. Today, if a government project goes over budget, if, that's never happened in <laughs> your cities, right? Mine either. Today, if a government project goes over budget, citizens are upset, uh, the media may write a few stories, but it is impossible for me to understand just how much of my money was overspent on that particular project. With crowdfunding, if I choose to financially give my money to a particular government project, I know exactly how much I, of my personal money went to that project, and all hell will break loose if that project goes over budget or doesn't happen for one reason or another. When you give citizens the ability to designate where government spends their money, you're inherently making government more accountable. And lastly, I believe that we can make the government budgeting process more participatory than ever before through crowdfunding. When going back to the story of Colorado Springs, the citizens were essentially asking for the ability to earmark their dollars to a particular government project or service. With crowdfunding, we can make that process far more efficient 
and far more scalable, giving citizens a louder voice in the process than ever before. Now don't hear me wrong. I am not saying that crowdfunding should replace taxes altogether. I am not saying that citizens should dictate to government how much money is spent on the most basic and fundamental of government services, services like police and firemen and sewage and water. But I do believe that we can make government work more like a vending machine, that we should make government work more like a vending machine, giving citizens the ability to pick and choose which parks, pools, and playgrounds government spends their money on. Our nation was founded on the principle that citizens should have a say in where government spends their dollars. This morning, as we discuss the future of stories, I would submit to you that this is a part of the next chapter of our American story. Thank you. Nice job, dude. You owned it. Thanks. <laughs>